You can have a seat. As you heard last week, uh, we ended up in a bit of a, a snafu, if you will, uh, with our scheduling. I was supposed to preach this sermon last week while Tim uh, was uh, in Cuba, and now I feel like the principal has come in to assess the class, and I have to preach while he's, he's here. So, uh, But uh, I'm excited um, to to be with you this morning um, and to bring the word for you. When Tim asked me to preach um, Isaiah 3 and 4, I had a little trepidation. Um, preaching passages of, of prophecy can, uh, can be difficult, uh, but I like a challenge, and here we are. Uh, much like the first two chapters, the Lord is using Isaiah to convey his displeasure with his people. Uh, the bulk of the first half of this enormous book speaks almost entirely of the Lord's anger uh, and impending judgment uh, that has come because of it. Chapter 3 is no different. God's people have ignored his presence in their lives, and for that, the Lord is going to rain down judgment upon them. God is going to strip them of the blessings that they've taken for granted and send their society into chaos. However, in the midst of all of this chaos, for Isaiah's generation, Isaiah sees beauty. And my hope is that by the end of this morning, you too will see the beauty of the redemptive thread that the Lord is weaving throughout these chapters. I think the fact that we're in an election year pairs nicely with this passage. On some level, you and I want our society that, uh, to be in order and to function properly with our best interests in mind. I think if we're honest, we look at the disrepute that cities like Seattle and San Francisco are in, and we fear that that sort of social disintegration is headed for our towns. Societal chaos is scary to think about. It's scary for us, and it was scary for Old Testament Israel. And even though Isaiah is the messenger of this impending doom, when he looks into the breakdown of society that we all fear, he sees the Lord at work. What the Lord is doing throughout the book of Isaiah is both terrible and beautiful at the same time. God's plan is to lead his people into great loss so that he can raise them to everlasting gain. Multiple times throughout this passage, the Lord says through Isaiah that he is taking something away from this generation. He says it in 3.1, and then again, he says he's going to take away even more in chapter 3, verse 18. So let's start with verse 1. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judea, or from Judah, Support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water. So we've seen the call to stop trusting in man and to pursue righteous living in chapter 2. Chapter 3 justifies that call of chapter 2 by opening with the word for. Isaiah has foreseen the Lord stripping things away from this generation. And what does the Lord start with in his removal of blessings? God starts with their most basic needs, food and water. And that makes sense because our country nearly fell apart a couple of years ago when you couldn't buy toilet paper. I mean, can you imagine the downward spiral that would ensue if suddenly we were without food and water? And that's the point. Because they have forsaken the Lord's presence and trusted in man instead of God, the Lord is stripping them of everything that contributes to their corporate life. And according to most of the commentaries that I read, this destabilization takes place when the Assyrians uh, invade somewhere around 720 BC at the end of Isaiah's ministry. Verses two and three. The mighty man and the soldier the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. 
it's here that the, be, that the Lord begins to explain the meltdown that is going to occur when verse 1 comes to fruition. The sense of national security is going to crumble because the Lord is taking away the mighty man and the soldier. Every piece of societal comfort is going away. On a national level, the Lord is removing the judge and the prophet. On a local level, the Lord is removing the diviner and the elder, the man of rank, the counselor, or you might say the mayor, the skilled magician, the expert in charms. They're all going away. The list in verses 2 and 3 convey the sense that the Lord is removing all of the blessings that they've taken for granted. Isaiah has mixed the legitimate offices with the illegitimate offices or the, the pagan offices. The point is, everything that makes society function is going to go away. There will be no judge or jury. There will be no craftsman. There won't even be a plumber to call. Even if Israel thought that they could rely on the pagan diviners and magicians, they won't be able to because the Lord is taking those away as well. A well-functioning society needs good leaders, and the Lord is removing them. Verse 4, And I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule over them. Not only is the Lord taking away their once stable leadership. He is replacing them with irresponsible boys. Now, some of you have young boys in your home. I'm a girl dad through and through, so I don't relate to you on a parental level uh, in this regard. But I was, in fact, long ago, a young boy. And I can't imagine having the type of responsibility that I have now when I was 10 years old. Parents, can you imagine your little boy being responsible for the welfare and the leadership of the city of Nixa? That seems like a bad idea. And yet that is exactly what the Lord is promising. Responsible leadership is going out the window. The leaders you will have will be like ruthless little boys who have no clue how to rule effectively. And then in the midst of all of this chaos, the people are going to turn on each other. Verse 5, and the people will oppress one another. Everyone his fellow and everyone his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder and and the despised to the honorable. Throughout the whole of society, there's going to be divisiveness and outrageous self advancement. Loudmouth teens will revolt. Honor for the elderly will be completely forgotten, and society as they know it will look more like a post-apocalyptic movie. Everyone out for themselves with no regard for another. It's starting to sound familiar, huh? Verses 6 and 7. For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak. You shall be our leader. And this heap of ruin shall be under your rule. In that day, he will speak out saying, I will not be a healer in my house. There is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me a leader of the people. In the desperation that's going to ensue, the people will look for someone, anyone, to provide some semblance of guidance, and they won't be able to find them. Those who are potentially qualified to serve will refuse, and the people will end up nominating officials who have no business being in office. The picture that Isaiah is painting here, when taken with the whole, is a society that has lost all faith in the governing bodies and now treats national welfare as a joke. There are times as both a pastor and uh, a parent that I have to issue uh, consequences quickly with, without explanation. Uh, after the situation has been dealt with, I then go back to that student or child of mine and explain what the offense was and why these particular consequences have been served. 
Uh, our Heavenly Father is, is no different in this regard in this passage. Having spelled out the consequences first in verses 1 to 7, the Lord then tells his people exactly what they have done to elicit such judgment in verses 8 to 11. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat of the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. Isaiah starts the first seven verses with like a a courtroom-like scene. And now he explains the crime. Israel has stumbled in both their speech and their conduct. And unlike most of us here this morning, this isn't a periodic slip up from time to time. We're all guilty of speaking and acting in ways that are out of step with the gospel from time to time. I mean, accidentally hit your thumb with a hammer and who knows what comes out of your mouth or how you respond. But that isn't what Isaiah is describing here. Verse 9 clues us in to the fact that this isn't a slip up. It's become a way of life. In fact, they are so consistent in their misconduct of speech and action that it's become normal. It's not even a secret. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Their sinful ways are written all over their faces, and there's literally no discernible difference between Israel and their pagan neighbors. Time and time again, the outward sins that we struggle with are actually symptomatic of of a deeper issue that's going on in our hearts. If you're honest, you'll find this to be true. And it's the same for Israel in this passage. So what is the heart level issue that is causing the outward sins that they're now boasting in? It's found in the last line of verse 8. Defying his glorious presence. The Lord of heaven and earth is both omnipresent and omniscient. He is everywhere all at once, and he knows everything. This is the reality of the God that we serve, but Israel didn't want to accept this reality. Israel didn't want a God who was always with them, and they certainly didn't want him to know everything about them. In their heart of hearts, They didn't want God to be too real. This is what did them in. They had tried to compartmentalize the Lord. Just let me live my life, and when things get tough, I'll reach out. Israel denied the fact that God's holy presence can't be put in a box. God is not a genie in a bottle, nor is he a 911 operator. You can't treat him like that. You can't just pull him out when when you need him and live your life the rest of the like the rest of the time the way you want contrary to his ways it doesn't it doesn't work like that this is a very deistic way of living and it's exactly what Israel was doing but if we're not careful we can fall into this way of thinking ourselves when life is going good and blessings abound, we're all tempted to place God on the back burner from time to time. And then when he removes those blessings or allows us to suffer just a little bit, we run back to him, desperate for him to help us. This is exactly the type of behavior that has brought about the judgment of the Lord upon Israel. And when it comes to this judgment, God is both judge and jury. He has found Israel to be guilty. But God is a good and wise judge. He doesn't dole out his judgments indiscriminately. Notice what Isaiah says in verse 10. 
Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. The remnant of the righteous, those who strive to live holy lives, will be rewarded. Now, don't misconstrue this as works-based salvation. That's not what the Lord is telling us through Isaiah. This is, a, this is simply an encouragement from the Lord to his saints to continue living fruitful lives that honor him. Society as they know it may be crumbling around them, but for those who trust in the Lord and lead righteous lives, they will be rewarded. If not in this life, certainly in the age to come. Because the reward of the righteous is a, is a heavenly reward, a true and better land of rest for all eternity. And so after a brief break in the courtroom scene in verses 8 through 11, Isaiah picks up with where he left off in verses 10 to 15. My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides must lead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge people. The Lord will enter in, uh, ent enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. Everyone who has denied the presence of, their, of the Lord in their lives is going to suffer the consequences. But sometimes, as is the case here with Israel, the leaders of a crooked generation are also to blame. And when God's people are taken advantage of, it hurts his heart. I mean, you get the sense of that here, that the Lord loves his people. It doesn't, doesn't bring him any joy to issue judgment on them. Oh, my people, your guides mislead you. You can almost feel the heartbreak that the Lord is, is feeling here. So what's, what is breaking his heart? It's the fact that the elders and the princes, those who were supposed to be looking out for the welfare of his people, have actually oppressed them instead. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. Even the leaders have forsaken the Lord's presence to the point that they're now oppressing the very people that they were supposed to care for. And this isn't the way of the Lord. At least that's not what Jesus says in John 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy, but Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus is the epitome of good leadership. But Israel's leaders haven't even come close to that type of leadership. Delighting in God's holy presence changes the way that we interact with the world around us. True revival sparks a care and a sense of responsibility for one another. But Israel's leaders have done the exact opposite. They've denied the Lord's presence and they've fallen headlong into their own selfishness. They've opened their mouths and devoured the, mo the most vulnerable among them. And the cries of the oppressed have reached the ears of the Lord. And so the indictment continues, 16 through 4.1. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants and the bracelets, the scarves, the headdresses, the, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets, the signet rings and the nose rings, the festival robes, the mantles, the cloaks, and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans, and the veils. 
Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn. Empty she shall sit on the ground. And seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. I think these verses are the, are the climax of this passage. Judgment has been proclaimed. The, the courtroom-like scene has, has shown why that judgment is just and 316 to 41 is the banging of the gavel when the sentence is finally executed. Now I want you to know notice what Isaiah is doing here. Or more accurately what he's what he's not doing. This isn't a chauvinistic rant against women. The selfish pride condemned here is this is of the same essence that that of the male leadership were uh, condemned of just a few verses earlier. This is a prime example of Isaiah's literal, uh, literary versatility, if you will. The overall flow of this passage is women of Zion, 16 to 25, Zion herself, verse 26, and then back to women again in 4.1. You could almost label this section like mother, like daughter. Isaiah isn't condemning the luxurious lifestyle of these women. There isn't anything inherently sinful about having nice clothes or fine jewels. No, what Isaiah condemns is their haughty attitudes. And paralleled with the sinful swagger that the men walk with in the earlier verses, Isaiah condemns the false displays of beauty from these women. These women are arrogant. It's not because of the fine clothing and jewelry that they wear. It's because of the conscious flaunting of themselves that upsets the Lord. Women don't need fancy clothes, fine jewels, or seductive glances to display beauty. The truth that Isaiah wants these women to see is that the Lord has already created glory for them. The true beauty of a Christian woman is found in a persona that emanates with the Holy Spirit. But since these women have prided themselves on their physical appearance. That's what the Lord is going to take away from them. It's going to remove what physical beauty they have left. Verse 17, Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. These women have devoted their lives to looking a certain way, which the world deems attractive. And now the Lord is going to place sores on their heads and lay bare their private parts. They've idolized their physical appearance to such a degree that the Lord is going to strike them with baldness, oozing sores, and shameful nakedness. Men won't look at them with wanting eyes. In fact, men won't want to look at them at all. The inner ugliness of their sin is going to become their outward reality. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets, the signet rings and nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Like I've already said, there's, there's nothing inherently sinful or wrong about having nice things in and of themselves. In fact, if you look at this list, these are everyday items that any wealthy woman, arrogant or not, would would probably have. But because of the arrogance, the Lord is removing their everyday conveniences. Forget the expense of jewelry, They won't even have a mirror to look at as they get ready. Now, I can get ready without a mirror uh, pretty well. 
Uh, but if you took away a mirror from my wife as she was getting ready, she would like flip a lid, right? And that's, that's the point. You know, whether it's an everyday societal convenience or everyday items of dress, it's all going away. Instead of the perfume, there will be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Do you see what Isaiah just did here? He's laid out the grim reality that is coming upon the proud by listing five contrasts. Sweet perfume will now smell like a decomposing carcass. Bracelets worn for ornamental fashion will now be like prison shackles. Perfectly colored hair gives way to baldness. Designer clothes will be replaced with sackcloth and good looks to disfigurement. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty harsh reality coming their way. But Isaiah isn't done and... Neither is the Lord. Verse 25. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in battle. Her gates shall lament and mourn. Empty she shall sit on the ground. And seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. Isaiah has, has let go of his use of imagery here and returns to the fate of the unrighteous. Invading nations will, will wreak havoc on the people of Israel. Israel's men will die in battle. Mothers will grieve the loss of their sons. Wives will mourn the loss of their husbands. And when it comes time to remarry, the women will outnumber the men who are left seven to one. Desperate for a husband to remove their uh, reproach, they're going to make a ridiculous offer. I'll take care of myself. I'll make my own food, wear my own clothes. Just please marry me so that I can take your name. In, verses, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6, we saw the men taking hold of other men, begging them to lead. In chapter 4, verse 1, we see women taking hold of men, begging them to wed. This is the setting in which Isaiah begins his ministry. Israel has forsaken the sovereign God of the universe and kept him at arm's length. And as a result, the Lord is removing the blessings that he bestowed on them and sending every level of society into chaos. But in all of this pruning, in all of the devastation that results from their neglect, the Lord is doing something beautiful. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flame, flaming fire by night for over all the glory, For over all the glory, there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and a refuge and shelter from the storm and rain. There is coming a day when devastation and war is going to end. There is coming a day when all of the pain that's caused by sin will be no more. There's coming a day when the dead branches have been disposed of, when new growth springs to life and produces the sweetest of fruits. There's coming a day when the true sons and daughters of Zion will be called holy. There's coming a day when all of the filthiness of our sin will be cleansed and will be made white as snow. 
There's coming a day when all things will be made new. No longer will the Lord's people keep him at arm's length, for his spirit will dwell inside of them. Hearts of stone will be made into hearts of flesh. The commands of the Lord's will no longer be burdensome or done out of obligation. will be like honey on the lips of his saints. There's coming a day when the wrath of God will be satisfied and his saints are at peace with him. When Isaiah looks deep into the devastation that the Lord has for his people, he sees beauty. Isaiah sees Christ. There's a day coming, and that's the day of the Lord. Out of the ashes will spring new life. Out of the grave, our Savior will rise, and the day of the Lord is coming. And that is beautiful news for those who have placed their trust in him. Verse 10, tell the righteous that it shall be well with them. And so if you sit here today seated in Christ and with Christ, it shall be well with you. You're already seeing the Lord making all things new. Not in full, but you can see it. You can feel it. The judge has banged his gavel and you have declared been declared innocent and justified by the blood of Christ's cross. That day is coming and it's beautiful. But if you're outside of Christ, if you're keeping him at arm's length, not fully embracing him, then woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him. If you are outside of Christ on that day, it will not be well with you. You will face the just consequences of your sins and the day of the Lord will be terrifying for you. On that day, dead branches will be cast into the fiery pits of hell and you're going to regret forsaking the Lord of creation. And so my plea to you is to stop ignoring the Lord. Stop forsaking his presence. Stop keeping him at arm's length. Repent of your sins and run full speed into Christ and let Christ run full speed into you. Ask him for a new heart, for for new desires. Ask him to give you new life. Ask him to save you. If not, the day is coming that's going to be terrible. Isaiah is proclaiming that the darkness of war and the violence that's headed uh, Israel's way. There's going to be a darkness that is dominated by war and violence, and it's headed for Israel. But in the midst of all that disordered darkness, the light of the gospel shines even more brightly. The day of the Lord is coming, and it will be both terrible and beautiful. The Lord is making all things new. Through his redemption, a true and better Zion awaits his saints. An eternal city where his saints rejoice in the realized presence of the Lord. A city where Christ is our good shepherd, our ruler, and society finally operates as it should without chaos, divisiveness, or pride. That's the city that I'm setting my sights on, and I pray that that's the city that you've got your sights set on. The day of the Lord is coming, and it is both terrible and beautiful. And so repent and make today the day of your salvation so that you can set your sights on that eternal city. 